Hi there, this is Dr. Ridwan and today I'm going to talk about a particularly interesting topic which is called drowning on a dry land. What does it mean? What does it actually mean by drowning into your own body fluid? Is it really possible? If it is, then how does it happen? To know more about this, we have to go back. We have to go back as far as the time when World War I happened. Let me tell you a story about this comparatively less known scientist. His name was Fritz Haber. He was a German scientist who won the Nobel Prize for inventing a process called formation of ammonia from hydrogen and atmospheric nitrogen under conditions of high temperature and pressure. Before Fritz Haber, nobody actually knew how to produce ammonia in the lab. And why is it important? Because we need nitrogen to grow our food in the field. The nitrogen you have in your body right now probably came from the process that was once invented by Fritz Haber. But Haber was a patriot. During the World War I, he was appointed by the German military to develop poisonous gas those were used in trench warfare. A scientist turned into a killer who actually is responsible for developing a process to feed the entire population of the world today. The poisonous gases those were developed by Dr. Heber and his team were so deadly that they would kill thousands of soldiers in a matter of seconds to minutes. These poisonous gases would attack the lungs of the victim and irritate the respiratory epithelium so much that the lungs would try to compensate this irritation by secreting fluid into the alveolar space. That would result in excruciating death of the soldiers due to the respiratory failure. Because the lungs would fill up with water in a very short period of time. We call this process pulmonary edema. I am going to explain how this happens. But before we go into further discussion, let us look at the lungs anatomy first. Human respiratory tract starts from the nose and it ends with the alveoli. Alveoli are tiny air sacs found at the very end of the airways. At the end of the nasopharynx, trachea starts, which gradually branches into bronchi. Just like the branches of a tree, but upside down. The trachea divides into the right and left bronchi and then enters into the hilum of the lungs. From there, they continue to branch off until they reach to the end. At the end, they transform into alveoli. These alveoli are very tiny air sacs. They function as a container for air. From these containers, red blood cells absorb oxygen. And before leaving the alveoli, they also dump the carbon dioxide into them, so that it can be released into the air. This exchange of gases occurs through the alveolar membrane that is about a couple of micrometers thick. We have an average 480 millions of alveoli in our lungs combined, where smaller lungs contain less than that and larger ones more. If we would spread all the alveoli and put them side by side, it would take up an entire tennis court. Such a huge surface area that has been crammed into such a small space in the body. And all that effort is to ensure a proper ventilation. Every day we go out and deal with many toxic air pollutants, those directly come into contact of the alveoli. And as a result, these sophisticated biological structures get damaged. But our lungs have the ability to fend off these toxic substances to some extent, so we don't die immediately. It is like a silent war between the environment and the lungs, where the lungs are at constant struggle to maintain body's homeostasis. Dr. Fritzhaber was researching for a gas that would absolutely overcome resistance of the lungs to obnoxious air particulates. And finally, he found one. It was the chlorine gas. This gas is so deadly that even a minuscule amount, if enters into the respiratory tract, would completely annihilate the respiratory epithelium and people would die. Let me explain how this happens. If you look at lung alveoli, you should see this. Please notice the tiny blood vessels, those are entangled around the alveolus. We call them alveolar capillaries. They are not actually separated from the alveolar wall, rather they are embedded into the alveolar wall. In fact, lung alveoli and capillaries share a same wall between them. When a toxic gas enters into the alveolar space, it reacts with the alveolar wall and as a result the alveolar wall gets damaged. 
This creates tiny pores within the alveolar wall and the fluid content of the blood, which is predominantly water, starts to pour into the alveolar space. Slowly, the whole lung tissue drowns into the leaking fluid. This fluid in the alveolar space prevents entry of air into the lungs just like the way it would happen if you would drown in water. Finally, respiratory failure sets in and the victim gradually starts to decline. If not resuscitated immediately, the victim would fall into a coma due to the hypoxia and finally die. The water that enters into the alveolar space comes from the blood. An adult individual has 5 to 6 liters of blood inside the body and about 50 to 56 percent of that blood is actually water, minus the cellular components of course. It is like we all are moving around with a deadly trap inside of our body just waiting for a toxin to trigger the trap anytime and it doesn't matter how far we live from the water, a dry drowning is always possible. That's all for today, I'll see you in the next video, till then take care.